The stomach is up here. This is just part of it. To get a clear look at the stomach, we'll remove several structures in front of it and below it, starting with this bulky fold of peritoneum, the dependent part of the greater omentum. Next, we'll remove these numerous loops of jejuno ileum that make up the greater part of the small intestine. We'll remove them by dividing the double sheet of peritoneum that attaches them to the posterior abdominal wall, the mesentery. After removing the jejuno ileum, we'll also remove the colon, which starts down here and goes up, across, and down. Along with the colon, we'll remove this double sheet of peritoneum that goes from the stomach to the transverse colon, the gastrocolic ligament. With these structures out of the way, we start to get a much clearer view. The last structure hiding the stomach is the liver. We'll remove this left lobe of the liver. Now we can see the stomach clearly. All this is the stomach. This is the underside of the diaphragm. Here's the esophagus coming through its hiatus in the diaphragm. In this view, we're looking up at the stomach from about this angle. Much of the stomach lies above the level of the costal margin, which is here. To get a more complete view of the stomach, we'll look at it in isolation. Here's the way in, the esophagogastric junction. Here's the way out, the pylorus, which leads to the first part of the small intestine, the duodenum. The narrow part of the stomach leading to the pylorus is the pyloric antrum. In this specimen, it's unusually narrow. This broad curve facing to the left is the greater curve of the stomach. This much tighter curve facing to the right is the lesser curve. This upward and backward bulge is the fundus of the stomach. It sits right below the diaphragm. Here's the inside of the stomach. Like all the parts of the gastrointestinal tract, its wall is formed by an outer layer of smooth muscle and an inner layer of mucosa. In the fundus, the mucosal layer is smooth. In the pyloric antrum, it's thrown into prominent longitudinal folds. At the esophagogastric junction, the muscle coat of the esophagus forms a partly effective sphincter that keeps the contents of the stomach from passing upwards. At the pylorus, the thickened muscular coat forms a highly effective sphincter that relaxes intermittently to let the contents of the stomach into the duodenum a little at a time. Here are the mucosal folds of the pylorus protruding into the duodenum. The greater omentum is attached along the whole length of the greater curve. The lesser omentum is attached along the lesser curve. Up here, its attachment is quite wide. This is the lesser omentum. Parts of it are fatty. Other parts are extremely thin. The lesser omentum goes from the lesser curve, here, to the underside of the liver where its attachment is just out of sight. It's attached up here to the underside of the diaphragm. The lesser omentum extends down here onto the duodenum, where it has a free lower border, as we'll see. Behind the lesser omentum, which will divide along this line, we come into an extensive back pocket of the peritoneal cavity, the omental bursa, or lesser sac, that continues around behind the stomach. We'll see more of it later. To see the greater omentum, we'll go to an earlier stage in the dissection. All this is the greater omentum. We'll pick it up to see its free lower border. Here's part of its attachment to the greater curve of the stomach. Between its peritoneal layers, there's a variable amount of fat. On the front, the greater omentum hangs free in front of the coils of small intestine. On the back, it's attached to the front of the transverse colon. The part of the greater omentum between the stomach and the transverse colon is called the gastrocolic ligament. If we divide it, which we've done here, 
we come again into the lesser sac, this time below the stomach. Starts as a straight tube. As it develops, it rotates on its long axis, lengthens in a double curve, and expands to become the stomach and the first part of the duodenum. The foregut is different from the rest of the GI tract. The hindgut and midgut are attached to the body wall by a double fold of peritoneum only along the back. The foregut is attached also at the front. Its two attachments are the dorsal mesogastrium behind and the ventral mesogastrium in front. As the foregut rotates, the dorsal and ventral mesogastrium rotate with it. The line of attachment of the ventral mesogastrium swings round to the right as the foregut develops. It ends up running along the lesser curve of the stomach and the top of the proximal duodenum. On the back, the attachment of the dorsal mesogastrium swings round to the left. It ends up running along the greater curve of the stomach and the underside of the proximal duodenum. While the foregut is developing, there are important changes in the ventral and dorsal mesogastrium. The liver develops in the ventral mesogastrium. The spleen develops in the dorsal mesogastrium. The liver grows rapidly, pressing against the body wall and obliterating these layers of peritoneum. These changes produce this almost separate pocket behind the stomach, the lesser sac. This part of the ventral mesogastrium is the lesser omentum. This part of the dorsal mesogastrium will become the greater omentum. We'll follow these changes from the start in a more three-dimensional way. To do that, we'll go to a view from below. Here we're looking up into the upper part of the abdominal cavity. This is the diaphragm. Here's the foregut starting to develop. Here's the liver developing in the ventral mesogastrium and the spleen developing in the dorsal mesogastrium. Here's the space that will be the lesser sac. This is the lesser omentum. This part of the dorsal mesogastrium will grow downwards to become the greater omentum. We'll move to a slightly lower vantage point so we can add the duodenum to the picture. The foregut ends here. So does the lesser omentum. This is the lower free border of the lesser omentum. Below it, the duodenum becomes stuck against the liver, leaving this opening, the epiploic foramen, that leads into the lesser sac. The dorsal mesogastrium is shown as though it had a free lower border along here, but in reality, this fold is continued all the way round to here, creating a sac that has only one opening here. To see how the greater omentum develops, we'll first add the transverse colon to the picture. The dorsal mesogastrium hangs down in front of the transverse colon. To follow its growth, we'll look at a sagittal section made in this line. Here's the lesser omentum between the liver and the stomach. Here's the greater omentum hanging down in a double fold. Below it is the transverse colon suspended by the transverse mesocolon. This is the pancreas. The greater omentum grows downwards in front of the transverse colon. The greater omentum and the transverse mesocolon come together, and the duplicated layers are absorbed, so that we're left with the greater omentum stuck to the transverse colon and hanging down below it. The lesser sac lies behind the lesser omentum, the stomach, and this part of the greater omentum, the gastrocolic lobe. Here's the stomach with its greater curve and lesser curve. Here's the esophagogastric junction, the fundus, the pylorus, and the pyloric antrum. Here's the dependent greater omentum, the gastrocolic ligament, the gastrosplenic ligament, the lesser omentum, and the epiploic foramen. Now we'll look at the blood supply to the stomach, which we'll put back into the picture. The stomach gets most of its blood supply from two vascular arcades, an outer one that runs in the greater omentum, or gastrohepatic ligament, 
close to the greater curve, and an inner one that runs in the lesser momentum near the lesser curve. The inner arcade is supplied at its two ends by the right gastric and left gastric arteries. The outer arcade is supplied by the right gastroepiploic and the left gastroepiploic, which is a branch of the splenic. Often the right and left vessels join to form a continuum. Here are the arteries that supply the stomach. The outer arcade supplied by the right gastroepiploic and left gastroepiploic and the inner arcade supplied by the right gastric and left gastric. Here's the superior mesenteric artery with its branches to the jejunoileum, the ileocolic, right colic, and middle colic arteries. Here's the inferior mesenteric artery, the left colic artery, branches to the sigmoid colon, and the superior rectal artery. Here's the superior mesenteric vein, the splenic vein, and the portal vein.